Hi, Watch Anime Recap here. Today we'll talk about an anime series called Gate. It follows the story of Yoji Itami, a Japanese soldier and otaku that finds himself in another world after entering a gate that appeared in the middle of Japan. Join us as we discover if he'll collect all the waifus and conquer his new fantasy world. Itami is a 33-year-old man that only works to support his hobby. And that's being an otaku. If you ask him to choose between the two, he'd pick his hobby in a heartbeat. And <laughs> not gonna lie, I'd do the same thing. Anyway, it's Itami's day off right now. And he's on the way to an anime and manga convention in Ginza. On his way, he plays an RPG game on his phone. His character, while doing a pretty impressive entrance, gets smoked quickly. Either he's not spending enough money on the game, or he's a filthy casual. Whichever the case, shame on you, Itami, sir. And you call yourself an otaku. Distracted, thinking about what he needs to do at the convention, Itami bumps into a concrete pillar. And in that moment, he has a vision of three girls. A busty elf, a blue-haired mage, and a goth lolly. And already, we can tell that this is a collect a waifu anime. And I'm not even complaining. He recovers from his daydream and prepares to move on to the convention. Out of nowhere, a gate appears in the middle of the road near Itami's location. Naturally, curious bystanders check it out, even wondering if it's a movie prop for the convention happening that day. To their surprise, a dragon flies out of the gate, and a legion of soldiers clad in Roman armor follow behind. Itami sees what's happening outside and immediately gets concerned about the citizen's safety. But that's a lie, of course. He's more worried about the convention getting cancelled because of the invasion. Now, even if he's only wearing casual clothes, Itami decides to help with the defense and evacuation of the citizens. With the help of the police officers already in the area, and several more that arrive later, they manage to guide the people to safety. Several days later, Itami gets commended for his actions during the Ginza invasion. It turns out that he's part of the JSDF, or Japanese Self-Defense Forces. He even gets promoted to a much higher rank and is treated as a hero everywhere. The only thing is, Itami's unhappy because the convention got cancelled, and he failed to buy the doujinshi he wanted. On top of that, now he has more work, which he hates. After all, as a self-respecting individual, Itami's job is only secondary to him. And with more piling up on his table, he has even less time to enjoy his otaku life. The Prime Minister of Japan also announces the plan to send JSDF forces through the gate, with the support of the US President. Three months of preparation later, the JSDF is finally ready to deploy their special task force that'll travel beyond the gate. Sure enough, Itami is among the ranked officers chosen to journey beyond the gate, which they now call the Special Region. After the signal, the JSDF begin their advance. Itami and the rest of the soldiers brace themselves for whatever dangers and horrors await them in the Special Region. Sometime later, the Imperial Capital Senate discusses with Emperor Malt about responding to the JSDF's recent assault. It turns out their army got obliterated by the JSDF during their encounter at the Alnus Hill Gate. Malt responds by sending messengers to rally neighboring states and fight for the Empire's honor. Once they gather, one of the commanders that answered the Emperor's call, Duran, feels something is fishy when he doesn't see the Imperial forces at their meeting point. Regardless of the Imperial Army's absence, the gathered allies of the Empire push through with their plan to attack Alnus Hill. Duran leads his troops to a series of losing battles, with their first attack resulting in 10,000 casualties and the second being 40,000. The reason for their defeat is simple. They are, quite literally, outgunned by the enemy. Their spears and shields are useless against the modern weaponry used by the JSDF. It's like playing Civilization, where Gandhi drops a nuke on your nation while you're still in the Bronze Age. In a desperate attempt for glory, Duran goes for a nighttime attack thinking it'll give them an advantage. It fails, of course, and in the end, the casualty count reaches 100,000. Sadly, however, it's all actually part of the Emperor's plan to neutralize the surrounding states. Without their armies, they could no longer launch a campaign to overthrow Malt and his empire. As icing on the cake, he orders his soldiers to destroy nearby towns and villages. He aims to cut off supplies and make the surrounding states depend more on the empire. The Imperial Princess arrives at the castle and asks her father what they'll do about the invaders. Since Malt only sees his daughter as a princess playing as a knight, he orders her to scout instead and assess the situation for him. She takes the Order of Roses and begins her journey to Alnus Hill. At the other side of the gate, the US President sits back and waits. It seems the US and many other nations plan to make their moves after Japan fails its operation. To them, the special region is a treasure trove waiting for them to open. In the special region, the JSDF forms six deep recon teams, and Itami gets assigned to lead one of them. 
Their mission, make contact with people from nearby towns and villages, and if possible, establish friendly relations with them. After meeting up with a few locals, Itami's team sees an enormous flame dragon wreaking havoc on a village on their route. They try to look for survivors, but to no avail. The dragon made sure everything got burned to a crisp. As they're about to leave the place, Itami finds a survivor at the bottom of the village well. He rappels down to rescue the survivor. And it's the sexy Onesan elf he saw in his vision earlier. Itami and his team quickly move to help the elf recover. While the girls take care of the elf, Itami listens to one of the male soldiers expressing his excitement about finding a real-life elf. It seems Itami isn't the only otaku in this group. After a while, Kurokawa informs Itami that the girl's vitals are stable. She then asks him what he plans to do with the elf. Since he can't leave her behind, Itami says they'll take her in as a refugee. He even boasts about how kind he is. Kurokawa calls Sus because she can feel Itami's ulterior motives. Anyway, Itami's team backtracks to Koda Village, a place they visited earlier. They inform the villagers about the dragon attack, causing them to panic. The villagers quickly pack up and begin to evacuate their homes, afraid of possibly getting barbecued. Among the people that rush to evacuate is a mage named Lele and her teacher, Kato. She gets curious about the JSDF, so she tries to get a closer look. While doing that, she gets into an accident and almost gets trampled by a horse. Fortunately, the JSDF saves her just in time. Later that night, deserters plan to ambush villagers passing by their area. Their talks get interrupted when a halberd-wielding girl that calls herself Rory Mercury appears. The deserters immediately recognize her as the bloodthirsty apostle of the dark god Emroy. Itami's unit escorts the Koda villagers on their journey to safety. After a while, they stop after seeing crows in the distance. They take a closer look, and it's Rory Mercury, the goth lolly goddess that Itami also saw in his vision earlier. The village children rush to greet her and even refer to her as an oracle. For some reason, she takes a liking to Itami and decides to join them on their journey. She even insists on sitting on his lap, effectively causing pain to the hearts of millions of goth lolly enjoyers. <laughs> Look at this lucky guy. Their journey gets interrupted again, but this time it's the flame dragon that raised the elf villager earlier. The elf wakes up, and the JSDF doesn't hesitate to take on the legendary beast. It appears, however, that their 50 caliber rounds simply bounce off the dragon's scales. The elf signals they should aim for the beast's eyes, and Itami orders his men to do so. They decide to hit it with an RPG and manage to take off one of the beast's arms with Rory's help. After the battle, the villagers and the JSDF part ways. They leave a few people behind in their care a few children, and of course, all of the girls that Itami saw in his vision. Unwilling to stress himself out about what to do with them, Itami decides to bring everyone back to Alnus Hill as refugees. Meanwhile, in a bar somewhere, Pina and her knights, Norma, Grey, and Hamilton, gather information about the JSDF. A waitress tells them about how they fended off a flame dragon. However, they seem skeptical about what the lady told them. It turns out that's a feat they deem impossible to do. The Onesan elf, Tuka, wakes up from a nightmare and sees they're getting closer to the JSDF space. When he arrives, Itami receives an earful from his superiors for bringing refugees to their base without permission. However, they're quick to forgive him because he managed to gather plenty of information for them. The only thing he regrets is that now, he gets charged with caring for the refugees he brought. The refugees are amazed by how quickly the JSDF build accommodations for them. They're even baffled by how the JSDF treats luxury amenities as trivial things. The refugees happily accept and adapt to their life in their new homes. Lele even learns to speak Nihongo, after realizing how important it is to communicate with their new friends. And she even picks up Japanese habits, such as giving thanks before eating. Meanwhile, back on the other side of the gate, China's president decides to maintain a diplomatic stance regarding the gate. However, he considers that it's also worth the risk and is prepared to send half of his forces if an opportunity arose in the future. As for the Japanese government, the prime minister gets questioned about the civilian casualties in the special region. To get more public approval, he points out that it was because of the dragon and not the JSDF. Back at the refugee camp, Lele, Tuka, and Rory get amazed by the indoor baths created by the JSDF. They talk about the gate and the idea that there are more countries besides Japan on the other side. Elsewhere, Pina speaks with Duran, who managed to survive their battle with the JSDF. He tells her that it was the Emperor's plan all along to have them slaughtered by the enemy. She promises to get to the bottom of things. She makes her way to Alnus Hill, stopping by Italica, a city on the way to her destination. 
Tuka starts worrying about having to repay the JSDF with their bodies for the hospitality they provide. However, all her worries fade after hearing the news Lele brought with her. It seems there are plenty of winged dragon corpses around the area, but the JSDF has no use for them. So they plan to let the girls take all their scales and have them sell them if they want to. Not long after that, the girls become part of Itami's team. They plan to go to Italica for another mission and to sell the scales they acquired from the winged dragons. While nervous at first, Tuka decides to trust the JSDF. After all, they not only saved her, but they even took out a flame dragon together. And with that, they set off for their next adventure. Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.